everyone. Welcome back to Blurred Box, our podcast where we discuss a variety of topics from our unique perspectives as online school students and time to time invite guests to take part in our discussions and share their views. I'm Chloe. Hi, I'm Haven. Hi, I'm Sophie. And today we have a special guest uh, who will be taking part in our discussion for gender inequality and equality. So this is Dr. Washburn. Hello, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a thank pleasure you to coming. have you. Um, as we mentioned in the past, we are a group of online students who attend Stanford Online University uh, High School. <laughs> and Dr. Washburn is one of our amazing instructors in the English department. So I guess before we get into anything else, um, Dr. Washburn, tell us a, a bit about yourself and I guess how you ended up at OHS. Yes, I'd be happy to. Well, let's see. I've been in education for a long time. I've taught at community colleges and public school and uh, in many different states. Uh, my first job out of college was teaching English in Japan. And now wow. I'm at Stanford Online High School in the English division. Um, and I'm really enjoying figuring out how to teach online. Uh, yeah, <laughs> everyone else is right now, too. <laughs> yeah, such that's yes, true. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess about a gender inequality, right? It affects everyone. It's with men, women. I guess with the modern times, we even extend that to transgender, non-binary, however you like might choose to identify yourself. But there are like stereotypes and or, like, you know, what they call rules about how men, women, boys and girls should, you know, be or conform to. And that starts all the way from your childhood. Right? And then it follows you too. like this kind of stigma mm -hmm. that always goes into adulthood. So, you know, not everyone really experiences gender inequality in the same way. And I'm, I'm sure you all have experience of it. Here's a fun fact. Also, we're still all girls here on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's and uh, yeah, so exactly. So we definitely have, I'm sure every single one of you has experienced some form of it, whether it, whether it's like, you know, Mata Harsh, and that applies to you guys in our audience, uh, who's listening as well. Um, and I can imagine for some it's worst. Um, obviously, it's different for everyone. And sometimes it's just really different in terms of people who face more than just one type of discrimination. So um, what are you guys' initial first thoughts on that? Like, do you guys have any particular uh, recalls of memory where, you know, something has either happened for you or something that you first recall from, I guess, that for you and your experience? When it comes to gender inequality? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, one of the first things that comes to mind, um, I, I have two things. Um, first of which would be like growing up, um, my first exposure um, to catcalling yeah. um, and street harassment, which is something that um, I had never really uh, anticipated, like, you know, when I was younger, but the first time I experienced it was when I was 13. Mm, um, yeah. And you know that's like a baby age um and I was in New York City and I was really shocked at that time but um when I I talked to um my male friends about it uh no one really seems to I think treat it as, as something that's um a really important issue to talk about I think they know that they shouldn't do it for the most part um but I think that that made a huge impact on me when I was growing up as it started happening more um too as I started going into you know cities more and there are more people around um, it just makes you feel unsafe. And I think that's something that a lot, uh, not to generalize, but I, I think that that's definitely a feeling that women tend to um, experience more. Um, and that's definitely impacted how I, uh, you know, uh, experience the world around me. So that's probably the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, yeah, I so I never really had anything blatant happen. Uh, that's a good thing that never happened. But um, it's just... I've always experienced like microaggressions or just like some yeah. inherent qualities that society has brought into our lives. It's just like as a woman, you know, you always think that you're always a little bit less than the man. It's quite sad that it's like that here. But I've never experienced anything blatant. And I think the reason why is because society thinks it's okay to act like this. We have not reached a point where equality is... Um, standard so for me it's just like I've always just had microaggressions I never had anything blatant so 
I don't know what yeah. you guys think. That doesn't make it less significant, though. I do want to point out. Um, I'm glad that you've never, you know, had any huge, you know, indicators of inequality. But I think microaggressions definitely add up, especially when you think about how young children are when they're being exposed to it. Um, then the more they're being conditioned to think that way. Right. And being a figure skater, I haven't experienced any sort of inequality myself personally, just because it's such a female dominated sport. Um, And of course there are males, but even pay wise, I haven't really heard anything about inequality in that terms. Um, But definitely I I'm sure there are, in other sports, Sophie can talk about this as well, yeah. but with USA Soccer, um, I mean, Sophie can talk about that because she's involved in soccer, oh. but what are your uh, thoughts? Yeah, I just, you yeah, know, I played soccer. I've been playing soccer since I was five, so it's been about 11 years, and, you know, it's always dominated, especially in sports that are not heavily female-oriented, more like half-half in a way. It's always thought that males are always superior and they're better and I think that translates into the pay gap and um, for like in U.S. women's soccer compared to men's soccer there is a pay gap even though I find it quite ironic because honestly the U.S. women's team has produced a lot more than the men's team especially in terms of World Cups wins and all that stuff but yeah it just shows goes to show um, that it's still apparent even though there's not really much cause for it. Yeah, I think something interesting is that also, I did some reading on this, and there are like some really interesting facts about how gender inequality affects all groups of society. And like for children, for example, right, starting all the way from, like Kevin said, like a baby age, or even in kindergarten, right, if you want it to, mm-hmm. you take it all the way over there. Um, they affect, it affects gender stereotypes, affects children's sense of self from a really young age, right, and everything we've been talking about for like, soccer and I guess any kind of um, particular job or field that you want, want to apply it to, you can like apply. It's crazy how you can apply it in terms of like whether you want to class that as like feminine or masculine. So what we're we talking yeah. about, like with soccer, right? It's a like the first instinctual kind of thing as a child, right? The first thing is like guys play soccer, mm-hmm. girls go sit on the corner and go have a tea party kind of thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> or cheerleading. <laughs> Or cheerleading. Exactly. Cheerleading, that's what I right? thought. And, like, even in the movies, it's also portrayed that way, right? I remember, okay, this is, um, you know that movie? It's, like, Cinderella Story or something like that. It's, like, there's the guy, the prince is, like, the soccer player, and then the girl oh, is yes. the one who's going, yes. yeah. the, the cheerleader? Yeah, that yeah. happens a lot. Right? A lot and then, in, like, TV shows, movies. Mm-hmm. I think of it in terms of uh, nurses and doctors, you know? If a guy right, is yeah. a nurse, that nurse should be emasculated, or if a woman's a doctor people assume she isn't you know yeah so for like teaching for example as well right um when we grow up also I think there there, I don't know what what it was like for you guys but for I think in general like there's also like a feminine kind of thing that's associated with teaching I don't know Dr. Washburn what is your take on that yeah well there's a lot of research and in this area for higher education in particular um So when I was a graduate student and then teaching at the university, you know, there's sort of report after report that talks, for example, about student evaluations of professors and how the uh, word brilliant is often used for male professors and nice (laughs) is used for women professors. This is really, you know, I think coming from a place of innocence, perhaps, or ignorance, but it's statistically significant And it really does affect female faculty and how they are seen in the classroom. They're expected to be nice and helpful rather than seen as experts in their field. So that's definitely an issue. The other thing related to that is that female faculty and people of color are often expected to do more service than others. So organize an event, you know, work with a club, set up this festival um, because they're Uh, male, uh, I guess, colleagues are seen as the researchers. And so women and people of color often end up doing a lot more of those kinds of day-to-day activities. And that too affects their experience. And then another generation of students who see that imbalance in people who have the same position in the same department at the same university. There's um, a really similar double standard that I've seen um, as a debater. 
uh, because that that's a sport that where you see a lot, you know, um, I had a partner um, who was a guy for many years um, and we had very similar debating styles. So we're, I feel confident saying we are very evenly matched um, debaters, mm-hmm. um, but there were definitely times we'd walk into a round um, and that saying that our, our speaking style tended to be aggressive. Um, so our judges would praise, you know, my partner and they'd say he was really, you know, going and getting it, you know, and being really aggressive and they, they loved how aggressive he was. And then they look at me and they're like, you've got to tone it down. You know, you, um, and they would tell me along those lines, you have to be nicer. You have to be more friendly. And so I don't know if it's a good thing or if I, I should have, you know, kind of kept sticking it to the man, but I, I did change that. Um, and so when I started being friendlier and being nicer and kind of let him do all the takedowns and I would just, you know, try to be friendlier and try to like show more weaknesses in the case. Um, then I started scoring better um, because that was just the image of the female debater that a lot of the judges were more comfortable with. Um, and it's a really similar experience that a lot of the, the other girls in the league have seen too. So um, it's kind of, it's disheartening to know that that continues, you know, through your um, professional career too. But um, I know that that's a common stereotype too. Just, you know, girls having to smile more, be more friendly, just be more welcoming in general. Yeah, I guess with the the whole stigmatism with that, uh, Pooja, with, I guess with uh, figure skating, for example, I think it's an interesting concept that with its performance base right i think so every you get points taken and judges judge you um you're not really in control of it right i guess coming from my perspective from tennis or even with sophie for soccer we score our points and you don't have a judge kind of judging us it's like you can win as ugly as you want you're gonna win your (laughs) point um but for figure skating you're judged based on someone else and you don't really have control on your points i guess what what do you think or like how do you have any experience in that particular aspect that even though it's like a female kind of dominated uh sport i think um What's your take on that particular concept? Right. Um, Figure skating is very much a subjective sport. As you said, it's not like running or soccer where if you score a goal or if you're the fastest person, you win. Um, It, there's a lot of factors at play, especially because it is a sport more for the people who can actually afford it because it's a pretty expensive sport as well. Um, So typically you see, uh, for instance, with Tanya Harding, she's a really well-known skater, but there is that oh, yeah. event where um, between her and Nancy Kerrigan, where apparently she, um, you know, caused injured. Nancy Kerrigan. <laughs> yeah, she injured yeah. her. Um, mm. So things like that. I mean, she was not from the best family or best background. She wasn't the most well-to-do and Nancy Kerrigan was. So some of those factors were at play as well. And I think you could see that with um, some people say that the judging could have been a little bit skewed more towards Nancy Kerrigan in some cases, just because she was more well-to-do. She fit that image of a beautiful, um, well-rounded skater who had like, great lines, great a- aesthetics, whereas Tanya Harding was known for her jumps and her athletic ability more than just her artistry. And sometimes that um, affected her as well. But you could also see she was the first lady to land us lady to land a triple axle. And that was a huge turning point. But then of course there are other factors that weren't in her favor and that, that kind of affected her in the long run. So you still see that stigma, even in a female dominated, dominated sport towards the more feminist ideal. Interesting. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I definitely see. Well, with, Oh, sorry, Chloe. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah. Um, I don't figure skate. Um, But I I have noticed that, um, you know, it's a stereotype that women put a lot of more effort into their appearance. Um, And I think that an assumption that a lot of people make or that a lot of men tend to make is that we do this. I don't, I I don't, I don't want to generalize on behalf of women. Um, But for me, (laughs) if I dress up or if I look better, um, I either do that for myself because I want to look good or I do that mm-hmm. um, because I feel I need to make, you know, a, a good impression on whoever I'm seeing right. um, or that, you know, could be in terms of the debate tournament. Like, for instance, I go and I'm wearing like 
a pencil skirt and a nice shirt and a suit jacket and my partner again shows up in jeans and you know a flannel really? and we get the same yeah we get the same really? scores um because he's That's not crazy. expected to look um well presented or to look um good um but i think that's something mm. that people tend to expect from women women more even subconsciously um is for us to be like first and foremost like attractive or to be pleasing to look at before they even are able to like get in a position to listen to us or to listen to what we have to say um or at least that's been my experience so i know that um looking good isn't always or you know like dressing up and stuff um isn't right yeah. always could, like a could that a choice. like stem from sort of like a societal norm that women are trying to compete for men's attention oh, yeah. rather than the vice versa i think it really stems from like our deep roots back then. which i've never really even How? seen a girl do i right? never <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel like I see that more in the movies yeah. than reality too. Yeah, I yeah, see a lot exactly. More men posturing and peacocking and like you know around girls and girls yes. do. But <laughs> I mean, I, I for me it's like equal. I think in that case, especially, I feel like I noticed it less because I was in a homeschool environment yes. community right. yeah. for most of my life. But like in soccer, I've noticed it a lot more than usual. Yeah. Yeah, and Dr. I feel Washburn like a lot of. Is... Sorry, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Doctor Washburn. For teaching, I guess online. What? How do you feel about that? Or like, um, if you know, comparing that to an in-person teaching environment as well. I'm sure there's like very different factors. I mean, like for both mm-hmm. students and uh, teaching faculty. I think right. Yeah, I think definitely. In some ways, I think the digital environment could actually help women that you don't sort of have the full kind of embodied presence of you walking around the classroom. Um, (laughs) But it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I will say, I know that I've over the course of my lifetime, I've been told enough times that I have a kind of uh, natural scowl. Sometimes I think that's my (laughs) my thinking voice or my serious face. Um, But I don't know any male colleagues who've ever been told to smile at work. And I have been more than once, not at OHS, but at other institutions by like students, by other faculty, by, you know, random people I've never met. And that even that small thing is just a reminder, like, well, I was thinking about something very seriously, so I don't actually need to smile (laughs) when I'm doing that. Um, Yeah. So those kinds of sort of interactions stand out. How have you started reacting to those like do you just smile or do you just say like okay thanks or (laughs) I don't know how to respond to those yeah I think ignoring it if you can it can be fine as long as you feel safe where you are um Mm -hmm. it is a reality that sometimes an appeasing smile if you're worried about your safety is something to take seriously um but I also think if it's someone I um, could talk to you, I will say, look at that person over there. Why don't you go tell him to smile? <laughs> or, or I will, uh, yeah. there's an artist in, out of New York who had a campaign about a uh, sort of version of catcalling, but about telling women to smile in public. And so she would do the sort of graffiti of unsmiling women around town and saying, don't mm-hmm. tell me to smile. <laughs> so I love that too. Just to, I, we should all have that in a card we can hand out or something to yeah. flash on our phone. Yeah, I'm thinking. It's don't tell me to idea. smile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. That's really interesting. I think also associated with that is also like I guess what we're not obviously not there yet. We're still in high school, but uh, when you get to that point, also it kind of affects salary difference, right? I think. Yes. At least from statistics show. I, I think you'd be able to elaborate more on that than I would. Yes, I I think it's really quite shocking how the statistics have not moved much. And so women tend to negotiate less for an opening salary bid mm-hmm. and so accept a lower bid than a male counterpart. That sets them behind mm-hmm. not just for that year, but five years down the road and 10 years down the road and 20 years down the road. Um, yeah. Another example from higher education is that For example, in some of the sciences, women have often been underrepresented among faculty. Um, Actually, now it's biology has more women than men. And so the thought is, oh, now women are doing great. They're more than 50% of biology professors. But the strange reality is that now 
nationally in the United States, salaries for biology professors have gone down. Oh, wow. yeah. oh. it's really wow. not a case of like, once there are enough women, then we're all there. It's actually a kind of strange yeah. evaluation of a discipline that is more women than men. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting to me is that actually, when you point that out, then when you put it that way, that the, the, the I think of it like at this, um, what do scales. you call this? The, the, the scales. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, my English doesn't work. Um, with the scales, right? When it's gone to like 70% of women in biology, then it goes to the men as if like, uh, there's the stigmatism. Um, it'll like, it looks a bit worse for like men, um, in that like general view, right, in the way that we're talking about, that this there's that's the stereotype beca- becomes it's lesser of a man to go into biology right. then because it's a women dominated field, if you know what I mean. Right. right. So if before it was great, you know, for a man to be a biology mm-hmm. teacher, as soon as yeah. it's women dominated, it's suddenly emasculated yeah. to be part of that field. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think. And yeah. it like happens in other forms, yeah. like nurses or dancers mm-hmm. or anything like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and I think that's one of the ways um, that it definitely affects um, men too, and you know, boys growing up too, uh, equally being told that there are a lot of fields that they can't go into. Um, I, I've also found that in even the places where the field tends to be women dominated. Um, so, for instance, Bujai I also I ride horses, so that's also typically you know a female dominated oh. sport. Um, yeah, and there, mm. there's you know strong representation by women in the professional field, but you also see that um, a strong major, not maybe not majority, but like a, a strong um, percentage of the professionals in that field are men, um, and the same for chefs. You know, where obviously cooking is one of the most traditional, stereotypical female roles to fill, mm. um, yeah. and so that's considered you know a feminine trait until you get to the highest levels of um, right. being a professional chef, you know, Gordon Ramsay. And, um, that's where you start seeing more men at the top of their field. And that isn't particularly because they're better at everything that they try. Um, you know, mm. but in the fields that they enter, then they're already given, you know, a leg up, even in fields where there are more women, because they've just been raised mm. in a way that makes them, like you were saying, Dr. Washburn, like more willing and more comfortable and more likely to get raises, you know, and to ask for them in the first place. Um, and being given those opportunities. So um, it's striking to me that even in, you know, those female fields, um, men still kind of rise to the top because they're still provided unequal um, opportunities to get there for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they also deserve to be there, you know, but um, so do the women. Yes. (laughs) Um, One of the, that makes me think about equal pay too. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Washburn. Oh, I was just thinking about, um, since we have so many athletes here today about coaching in sports, that um, there are certainly famous female coaches across many different um, forms of sports. But in terms of like male professional sports, it's almost unthinkable to have a woman on staff. And yet professional sports on the women's side most often have a male coaching staff. So even that is seen as natural somehow for women to have a male coaching staff and unnatural for men to listen to a woman in the NBA or the NFL. I think in my club, I don't think there's a single woman coach that coaches a boys team. I know I personally have a woman's coach for my team, but I've never seen the opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for me, um, being a being a tennis player, um, I've spent literally since uh, more than a decade in the in that particular sports field, and I've only ever had one female coach. Wow! And that's really stark difference compared to, and also a lot of the academies that I've been to for training. Right. So, um, just to elaborate more on like that particular setting. Um, the these academies that you go to um to train they're basically like a a camp a boot camp (laughs) if you want to put it that way and um you're basically in this environment where you are set up to do a lot of training you spend a lot of time with um with these coaches right and a lot of other players and they put you in different groups and you just you know you you work on the particular things that you need to work on as an athlete if you want to succeed in you know um in competing and all of the whether it's like um everywhere in the academy 
I've always been surrounded by men and by men coaches. Um, and I don't know how particularly that might affect me or like even for Pooja, maybe you can elaborate on how that, how it is, or like Sophie for you in, in the soccer field, but for tennis, um, all of my coaches have been men and that extends all the way in the academy, all the way from the, it's whether it's the physio or whether it's like our mental coach, uh, I don't know how to explain the mental coach, but it's like they help you map out um, very sp- when you get to that level and um, strategizing for particularly how you want to play to win your, your matches against certain people and you analyze a lot of stuff. Those are also men. It ranges all the way um, to our fitness coaches as well and the assistant coaches. And then whether it's even the people who are organizing everything for tournaments, they're all men. They're like, you know men everywhere on the, the academy and it's annoying not to see enough women there so I guess yeah so- Sophie how how is it for you yeah I, I, it just kind of it's not actually about me but it really reminded me of a story I was reading about Mary Kane who was mm. the fastest girl in the world until she joined Nike um that kind of circulated a lot and it showed how she was like at the top of her career she was 16 she was considered the fastest girl in the world at straight A's and everything and then she joined Nike and then everything deteriorated because um, her male coaches wanted her to get thinner because that's what they thought right. will get her faster. But yeah. that in turn made her worse and made her slower and made her like develop an eating disorder. And it's showing that it's sometimes it should not be like that because like the male coach thought um, Mary Kane should be thinner, but in reality she shouldn't have because that's just not how her body's built. Yeah, I thought that was just an interesting the thing to bring up. Yeah, absolutely. I think a- another reason for all this might also be that um, I think people still have um, a very outdated notion of what you know a woman's end goal is. That being being a mother and and raising a family and being a wife. Mm-hmm. Um, so oh, I yeah. think that uh, a lot of companies um, make the decision. Um, that women don't need to progress as far in their career as men do because there's like an earlier end point for them or stopping point. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons for, you know, um, the pay gap is, is the raises and, and everything like that simply not getting equal pay for equal work. But it's also that um, employers want to invest in men more because they expect women to run off and get pregnant and start a family and, um, and, and oh, not yeah, be a professional yeah, yeah. anymore. Sure. Um yeah. And even if that is a choice that, you know, the woman makes um, to do that or to raise a family, she shouldn't have to choose between a successful professional career um, and, you know, a successful home life as well. So um, it's interesting that we still rely on women as like homemakers, you know, like I, I see a lot of the time if a father is left at home with their child or or watches them for the weekend, you know, people praise mm, them for babysitting yeah. and they're like, oh, good for you. Like, yeah, you're doing normal parent things that your wife yes. is 364 like, you're the days father. a week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that yes. we still kind of rely on this idea of like women having children um, and therefore they don't need to work, you know, um, which also puts you know, like single mothers at a huge disadvantage, even more so than they already are. But um, right disappointing i don't know yeah yeah for like i think what um i don't know this is like uh actually for at least um in australia we have um from statistics in australia one in every two mothers experience discrimination during pregnancy or you know on parental leave or when returning to work Mm -hmm. i don't know um how that how that stats might differ in the u.s but um dr washburn in 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 the years that you've worked in your field, do you, how often do you see that? Or kind of like, what do you see from that? Or have you kind of like um, dealt with that ever as well? Yeah, I think it's a common issue for a lot of women, especially if they want to be pregnant and have children in their thirties or later or earlier, um, that the, mm-hmm. the weight of that um, childcare often falls on their shoulders, even if they have a partner who at the outset seems to be someone who believes in an egalitarian (laughs) partnership. Um, When it gets down to it, they're the ones who often do a lot more and it can be a real strain if you're also working to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. 
I think of parental leave is for both parents. It helps women if men take parental leave too, to just sort of reconfigure what it means to have a newborn at home or a small child or, you know, when um, a, a kid is sick from kindergarten that you don't always have the mother who's working come in that maybe you call the father too. And that person has yeah. to take a half day. So those are things that are hard to um, legislate, but I think they have a lot to do with the dynamics of relationships and um, things you can kind of see around the corner, but then a lot of things that in the moment you might not have expected to find yourself in. Yeah. So I've definitely seen that. I think that starts yeah, sure. really early too, that, you know, idea of the, the girl is like very nurturing and kind, you know, and that carries over into you know teenage and then adult relationships um where yeah, you're supposed think, to take care of you know yeah I no see yeah that. i think sure. i think it, you see that more because like it's still ingrained in our society so you see your mom doing all the work and then your dad is going out and like getting money or like being the breadwinner quote unquote but mm -hmm. um yeah so it just really instilled at a young age so just brings it up in your adult life and that's how you think life is yeah and i mean yeah, i yeah, i'm thinking sure. of <laughs> like really early on in like first or second grade you know when the teachers go can i get some like big strong boys to help me move these chairs over <laughs> um and then back then like something was bugging me about it i couldn't tell what but something was bugging me i was like i could move those if i wanted to but already you know it's putting um the boys in the position of like okay we're strong we're uh we're helping out we're being really you know um manual and physical about this um and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that isn't that same responsibility wasn't really given to the girls um or if it was yeah. you want to know like I, yeah sorry do you want to know like a funny story is that um also um traveling a lot um i don't know puja you might relate to this because like um when you travel often you carry a lot of big luggages <laughs> a lot of big suitcases and people look like um Again, this hasn't been like told to my face, but I do travel with my mom, and naturally, um, I, we have a lot of big luggages. And I, like, I've been traveling since like ten years old, um, as a really young age. And when you're traveling across the world, you don't carry small luggages; they're big luggages. I've emphasized that enough. But it looks really weird for some reason how a ten-year-old scrawny little girl with a whole bunch of tennis rackets is carrying like three big, <laughs> like. 10 kilogram suitcases around and like pulling it off the rack right and i'm like heaving <laughs> it off and people are like why where's the man kind of like to pull it or like even and i get i'm there's like a really weird thing because i've been doing this for so long and i've just been in control of kind of like my own kind of stuff in um in traveling or whatever it might be or what if it's like heavy i'm like well i'm t I, I completely disregard this kind of like masculinity of like the man has to carry mm -hmm. the suitcase this is a really small matter but like it gets me like really <laughs> into it um we have um taxi drivers right who are men and they um they're like they they they're like oh i'll take it for you but it looks really weird upon me when i'm like well i'm so used to this i'm like i grab the luggage from him, i'm like throwing it into the into the boot of the truck on my own and and he's like looking at me funny i'm like 10 or 13 i'm like what it's my luggage it's my luggage it's my suitcase and then he's like okay well I and then it's like, yeah so anyway well. so it's scaring like... taxi drivers <laughs> yes i do the same no. thing i have this like yeah. compulsive need around guys to carry my own things yeah and and, be, and yeah. they think it's weird you know and it is weird like it's a strange thing to get stubborn over you know if we're like yeah, carrying yeah. bags or, see, or see i'm I mean. holding something that you know a lot of the times is very heavy for me and they would have an easier time mm -hmm. carrying it but i'm holding on to it because i'm like no like this is for equal rights and they're like hey then you're being stupid <laughs> like you're just being dumb right now but i, I would keep carrying oh yeah no, I need to do this. I, uh, yeah <laughs> i can definitely relate uh, to that honestly that i kind of i'm kind of like i'm proud of you for doing that because i <laughs> you know, exploited my, like, <laughs> femininity to, like, get people to carry things for me. You just, like, like, started your I campaign. Know I've been, I've been like, playing the soccer suitcase is for gender equality. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been playing soccer my whole life. So I have really strong legs, but I've done nothing on my arms. So, yeah, I'm a little weak when it comes to that. So I'm like, 
do I really want to carry this? No. Yeah. So That's then I like, just get other people that can. Yeah. It's so hard. I have like yeah to figure out oh, when sorry. you want to like exploit gender inequality for stuff like that. Mm, like yeah. you can't pick and choose what. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. For another like field in life <laughs> on a comedy aspect, um, when I go to the gym. Okay, this might be a bit unrelated to, but this also is like a pet peeve for me. <laughs> when you go to the gym, right? Um, in the general aspects of life, we're talking about like how women are meant to look good, right? Can I just like note as well um, the way that your physical traits kind of also come through in society? That's like another kind of like stereotype or kind of like a a thing that like women um, with with uh, bigger breasts or like um Mm -hmm. or a bigger behind or something is supposed to look be looked upon as like nicer or whatever and like for men if you have bigger muscles right you have like bigger biceps or whatever right that characterizes them it's like more masculine like you're the man well done for you good on you so when i go to the gym naturally i feel this very um it's not like aggression but like it's like why when men go to the gym right this is probably me just ranting they always like go they go straight to the dumbbells the arm and they go straight yeah. and they're like oh get, get my <laughs> muscles and get my bicep i'm like why aren't you running <laughs> go on the treadmill for once like you never have all this leg day. <laughs> exactly yeah right? it's like that's, because what, they're that's so... the only thing i do in the gym is just legs right. and running right? so like the that's first really thing they go important. to is like they want to get the muscles but like where are you yeah. where, what leg muscles are you going to carry all that it's, muscle it's like with? strange sexualization like, of different things for yes. men and women um, right so, that, so it's like such a small thing that expands into like a lot of different areas mm-hmm. right so yeah just in that particular aspect like they're walking around like the letter t when you belong <laughs> on sesame street like yeah t for sesame. and also i don't know if you guys have experienced this but with dress code and brick and mortar schools um yes. you know with short length and even at my old um brick and mortar school they wouldn't allow you to wear ripped jeans like ripped jeans for girls was not allowed at all which was very surprising oh, yeah. to me because like why can't you show even like ripped jeans in your knees like I understand yeah. a, like a huge rip that or like super short shorts but and then like mm-hmm. boys just wear yeah. shorts and it's like they're fine it's but strange when it comes because to women, I, no. I've also found it strange when they have teachers you know they they put the burden on teachers to hold them accountable to the dress code and it's strange right. like do you really want a male teacher looking at their you know 14 year old student and saying like you're too sexualized right now like hey, I, I, you shouldn't be in this room um i yeah. think that's really yeah. really yeah. problematic yeah um, yeah yeah that was me so like when i was applying for schools my mom wanted me to apply to the school that had a dress code mm-hmm. and i really did not want to go to that or like a uniform but i didn't really want to go with it because i went to their open house and their skirts were like short really short I was like what what are they trying Mm. to like instill here and I get that you can wear leggings you can do whatever you want but I just feel like having that mentality where girls are supposed to be put in skirts especially since there's a lot of like historical significance to women wearing dresses and women then turning into and wearing pants Mm -hmm. I just find like why are they trying to do that and I was always wondering so I never wanted to apply to those schools Mm -hmm. that had a uniform like that yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that was only me. No, that definitely goes back to, you know, having specific roles for the genders. And those roles are, like, inadvertently um, supported, like, perpetuated by also having specific mm-hmm. um, clothes and, you know, a certain way you're supposed to look and stuff like that. Because you're dividing yeah, exactly. people already into, like, two very distinct binary groups. Um, right, yeah. yeah. So, like, even if it's just the clothes, it's just, I guess, our our main kind of point we're kind of making as well as is just that there's this specific kind of mold that our society has kind of decided to carve out and place as a cookie cutter or like a default for every single um, man or woman. And like, even now we're, I guess now that we're more accepting, I would think um, in this particular generation of like, however you might choose to identify if it's like non-binary or transgender or whatever it may be, it gives us more, of a broader scope in terms of like how we're trying to uh move away from that and just also to preface that um my example of making fun of people going to the gym and like working on like your muscle or whatever like (laughs) applying to like not just men and women but that's also kind of a like a society's 
um, outcome, right? And mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's kind of like a bad thing, but it's just something you notice and like something to poke fun out of, if you know what I mean. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like at least, at least society is changing. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. a good thing. There's a lot more female empowerment, more movements regarding that. And mm-hmm. I think that, yeah, it's not changing fast yeah. enough. I'm really excited. But at least we can be positive that change is ensuing. Yeah. I've seen a lot right. of yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, male allies now come out. I, I think people are less afraid to identify with the gender equality movement because I think people are realizing now that, you know, gender equality means gender equality. It doesn't mean... Exactly. Women now yeah. want men to be subservient or something like that. Like mm-hmm. we're creating this different hierarchy, but um, there's a lot more education surrounding this, you know, um, on how yeah. men should act, on how women should react. Um, yeah. So yeah. I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to Yeah. It. There's like, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's like that. I guess um, we did talk about like the, the kind of like toxic pressure on, on not just men and oh, sorry, not just on women, to conform to a certain way, but also on like men to be a real man, and that 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 burdens right. men who actually are, extend further than that. Um, and that's something I guess we will we have that in mind for a future episode mm-hmm. to um, see how um, other boys, I guess, and our classmates, or perhaps even uh, another instructor, to uh, <laughs> yeah. that'll be interesting yeah. to see how. So, yeah, yeah, to see how, how yeah, they feel about it. that and see because, how they, you know, yeah, how they react. there's also society's standards on men. Exactly. So yeah. I just, it'd be interesting to, to see how they it kind of goes both ways. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess our, yeah. our full takeaway from this is that the, um, for, for you guys listening, there is there, the, keep in mind the, the benefits of gender equality, everything we've t- touched over um, kind of relates into, you know, um, it prevents, violence against like women and girls Mm -hmm. i think um as an underlying kind of thing it's good for the economy too in different ways and i guess at least in australia um you guys might be able to elaborate for what it is in america but in australia gender equality is a human Mm -hmm. right yeah australia has committed to equal rights for men and women through a convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women through uh we have like the equal act uh no equal opportunity act in 2020 and more so um yeah anyway that it's just to to show that in society we're pushing that i guess yeah. now in modern Our, modern uh, times equal right rights amendment in the us is getting pushed around state by state yes. that has some yes. controversy surrounding mm. it but that's mm-hmm. you know for 40 years <laughs> we've been working on that <laughs> yeah <Yes. laughs> slow and steady <laughs> it's a slow progress yeah i mean it's At least it's progress give it like give it another 60 years <laughs> <laughs> But it yeah. shouldn't. Hopefully, change is exponential. Yes, so no. hopefully, yeah, for sure. Slurred box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, anyway, um, I guess thank you guys for your time. Well, keep in mind, suitcase for equal gender equality. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Equality. <laughs> yeah. Thank you thank so much, Doctor Washburn, for coming Thanks on for today. Me. And thank you so much. Sharing. Yeah. So this was our. Uh, if you enjoyed our conversation today, be. be be here for next week for another uh, another discussion, perhaps with uh, on a male classmate coming in and more differing views. So this is the Bird Box podcast. Uh, we had Sophie, Haven, Pooja, and Dr. Washburn today. Thank you all for listening, and I'll be sure to um, see what we can do for next week. Well, Bye. anyway, so thank you guys for listening. Thank I'll you see you for all. listening. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Yay!